Hey Crossbridge, it's Wednesday and it's time for your soap update. Today you are in chapter three of the book of Jeremiah and Jeremiah is the beastiest book that we have tackled as a church since we started soaping together. It's one of the major prophets of the Old Testament and you know what makes this amazing is that it's a major prophet in a sense that what Jeremiah has to say here isn't more influential than any of the other prophets. It just simply has everything to do with the size of this book. And we're looking at, at, at about since we're in January now, we're going to be taking Jeremiah through all of February and into March. So Crossbridge, this is the time to kind of buckle down and dive into a book that is so easily misunderstood by so many and I want to promise you this, that in, in the chapters of this book, in the next month and a half, you have an opportunity to learn some amazing things about God. And I believe that there are challenges for our everyday life. And there are words, because the Word of God speaks to us, that He wants to speak in our life through these chapters. You've probably already noticed that it's a strong worded book. We haven't read a book like this yet because most of the books we've read have been historical narratives. They've been these tellings of the stories of Israel or the church or a biography about Jesus. We understand how to read a lot of those things, but we don't always understand how to read prophecy. And what you should know about this book as you jump in is there's about 40 years worth of time that's going to happen from Jeremiah 1 through the end of this book. And so for, for 40 years, these are prophecies that Jeremiah has received from God and given and visions that he's received and told. And what's really important is to understand there's a lot of space in between some of these prophecies. And it's not like it's just going to flow real easy. There are some moments you're going to have to stop and say, when is this happening? And look to the king that's being referenced or something like that to help you understand the context of Jeremiah. You'll also need to know that, that most of this is a collection of all of his writings kind of put together. So it definitely does read like an anthology. So take your time with this. If you're getting a little frustrated, that's okay. Um, jot down those questions. Let's journey through together. Jeremiah 1 started out with this amazing call to ministry for Jeremiah, that he was going to have to stand up and say whatever God told him to say to all the people of the nation. And that included families, that included pastors and priests, as they would call them then, that included the church or the synagogue, that included the kings, um, both present and future, that were going to be on the throne. He had some strong words for everybody, and God said, you stand up and say it, or I'm backing down. And so Jeremiah is a book that's filled with some very tough truths. So he receives that calling in chapter one. In chapter two, he begins to dive right in, and he begins to use a, you'll find a lot of uh, imagery used throughout Jeremiah. And one of the main images that is used is the image of prostitution. And he uses some sexual imagery throughout this book. So does the prophet um, Ezekiel. When we read that, you'll see it again. But God equates his relationship to Israel as a marriage. And he says, I've chosen you. I've made a covenant with you. And for some reason, I'm upholding my side and you're not upholding yours. It's like you've been cheating on me. You've been cheating on me with all these gods and all these things and, and not just cheating on me, but now it's like you're a prostitute sitting on the side of the road waiting for the next dude to please. And you're not satisfied anymore. What did I do that frustrates you so much? And he keeps trying to call them back into this relationship. And as we hit chapter three, um, I, I, there's a couple of quick verses that I wanna, wanna bring to you today to kind of set the tone for where we are currently in our culture and maybe some things for us to really process. And as I looked at verse five, um, there is this idea where Israel is kind of talking back to God and they say, surely you won't be angry forever. Surely you can forget about it. And this is all those things that they went wrong. And so God says, so you talk, but you keep on doing all the evil you can. And I think there are times as I looked at this and God has brought me to ask the question in my own life, where do I talk about following Jesus? Where do I say things about living a generous life or being a person who forgives or, um, you know, walking with people no matter how messy life gets and, you know, how exhausting someone might be that it's okay. And, but you don't do it. Like you, you say, Jimmy, do it, but you don't do it. You say to pray, but when are you praying? You say to read, but when are you reading? 
they're all talk. And it just kind of made me kind of reevaluate how does my relationship look like? What do I talk about, but not necessarily do? And then later on in verse nine, it says that Israel treated it all so lightly that there's all these sins that they just don't seem to care about. And they talk up a game, but they do nothing. They just don't care. And not only that, but Judah, this lower nation in verse 10, has never sincerely returned to me. She's only pretended to be sorry. And there is something about this repentance that we've talked about over, over the last couple of weeks in confession of truly being sorry for what we've done and turning back to God. If the Holy Spirit has not begun to stir these things in your life, you, you may have a difficult time in Jeremiah because it's filled with stuff like this, forcing us to look in the mirror to say, it's easy to pick apart Israel and Judah to say, how messed up are you? But then again, when we turn around, we have to look at us and say, am I any better? And then as we look at to the end of this chapter, I, I take a lot of heart knowing that God calls his children back and there's this little bit of hope that's instilled in here. And I, I just want to encourage you that no matter what the Holy Spirit is doing in your life, when conviction comes into play, always remember that the hope of God is to bring his children back. The children who go wayward, it's to call them back. And while Israel is going to complain and moan constantly saying, we don't deserve this, the justness of God says, yes, you do. And I still love you and I'm bringing you back. And so Crossbridge, I hope and I pray that what you say lines up with how you live. That the thoughts that you have are empowered by the Holy Spirit to live out love and trust and obedience to the very word of God and that the book of Jeremiah would be encouragement to you and fuel as you pray for our country, for our church, and for your own life.